Let's look at an early study that tested the foot in the door technique. Friedman and Fraser phoned 36 people and asked them for a little favour. They asked people if they would answer a very short survey. So they asked, would you like to participate in a short phone survey? It's going to take two minutes. We just want to ask you about the kinds of household products that you like to buy. So it's no big deal. Phone surveys were probably something of a novelty back then. Everybody said yes. Then a few days later, the experimenter rang back and said, that was really helpful, he did that survey for our spot. We need a bit more from you. And actually, what we really would love is if you would allow the team of our researchers to come into your house and to go through your stuff and actually catalogue the detergents you buy, the soaps you buy, and so on. This is gonna take about two hours. Is that okay with you? Now, that's a pretty big favour. But all the same, more than half, or actually 53% of the people said, yes, by all means, I'm happy for that to happen. That seems like a big number. More than half of the participants are like, yes, send your team of strange men to go through my stuff for two hours. But is it really? How can we tell? What we need is a control condition in which you don't use the foot in the door technique. So that's what they did. The researchers contacted another 36 people who were not involved in the experiment up to this point and just came out with the big request. Would it be okay if I send a team of our men to go through your stuff for two hours? When they just cut to the chase like that, far fewer people agreed. This time only 22%. This is the foot in the door technique and we know this works across hundreds of experiments. But why does it work? The reason seems to be that agreeing to the initial request causes individuals to see themselves as having certain characteristics. They start to think about themselves as that kind of person. This happens through the process of self-perception. So you agree to the initial request and you start to see yourself as the kind of person who helps others out. When you're asked a larger favour, you agree because doing so is consistent with the type of person you are. Once you've made that initial commitment, you like to live up to that commitment even as the cost of those commitments start to climb. It's a nice thing about human nature. It's also something that leaves us vulnerable to being exploited. Not all commitments are equally binding though. We also know from studies that this type of technique is going to be the most powerful when the initial commitment is active, effortful, made publicly in front of others, and not coerced from you by pressure. Sometimes people say, if you want to set a target for yourself or whatever, just write it down. Put it on the fridge, put it above your bed. You've then got your own words haunting you. Quit smoking, study more, eat better, whatever it is. Another thing you can do is run around and tell everyone about your target. Tell everyone you're gonna give up smoking. With these kind of public commitments, we feel the need to live up to them. If you tell everyone that you're gonna give up smoking, the next time you're tempted to have a cigarette, you're just imagining their judgment. You're thinking about all the shame that's gonna rain down on you as people see that you've weaseled out of your own promise. These things are binding, but here's the trick. We're talking about exploiting people's need to live up to commitments. If you're going to exploit it, if you're going to manipulate people, the art in it is to make them believe that they freely chose that commitment as opposed to being pressured into it. There's no point, there's actually very little point saying to people, please tell me you're gonna give up smoking. You've got to give up smoking. It stresses me out when you smoke all the time. Please, please, I'm begging you. Now eventually, they might just go, fine, I'll give up smoking. That's kind of a commitment, but not one that's particularly valuable because it was forced. The next time they feel like having a cigarette, they won't really feel the need or obligation to live up to that forced commitment. So we're going to have to lure people into making their own commitments.